Welcome to Navigating Advocacy, the true crime podcast that goes beyond storytelling to ignite change and seek justice. I'm Melissa. And I'm Whitney. As true crime enthusiasts turned passionate advocates, we've seen the power of storytelling raise awareness about unsolved crimes and bring hope to victims and their families. We hope to inspire action and promote positive change within the true crime community. Our mission is simple. We provide a platform for victims and their families to share their stories, to be heard, and find solidarity. But we don't stop there. We offer practical guidance to our listeners on how they can actively make a difference in their own communities. In each episode, we'll discuss a different unsolved case. We'll examine the details, highlight potential leads, and strive to spark new interests that may help advance the investigation. Our goal is to reignite hope and ultimately bring justice where it's long overdue. But this podcast is about more than just a conversation. It's about building a community of like-minded individuals who share a common purpose, making a real difference in the fight for justice. Whether you're a seasoned true crime fan or new to the genre, we invite you to join us on this journey of discovery and advocacy. Together, we can create a wave of change. We're here to empower you to also become advocates for change, no matter where or who you are. We are Navigating Advocacy. We discuss topics that may be sensitive to listeners. Discretion is advised. This week, we are Navigating Advocacy in Oklahoma. This week's case takes us to a town in Oklahoma that is so small, even Wikipedia refers to it as a village. In 1986, when this story took place, the population of Loco, Oklahoma, was around 160 people. Since then, Loco has been in steady decline. In 2000, 150 people live there, and according to BiggestUSCities.com, in 2020, only 101 people called Loco home. The entire town exists in less than one square mile and sits about 80 miles south of Oklahoma City. It has one main road, no stoplights, and only a handful of side roads. In the early years of settlement, it was actually a thriving farming community. And in the early 1900s, Loco had three churches, a bank, four grocery stores, a general store, three doctors, a dentist, a drugstore, a blacksmith, and a gin. Of course, like most states, the oil boom helped the growth of Loco for several years and the population bloomed to around 600 people. Then, in the early 1980s, the population started to decline. This left many abandoned buildings, including churches and schools. And as you can imagine, in a town this small, everyone knows everyone. Frankie Levon Duval was called Bonnie by everyone that knew her. She was a 39-year-old mother, stood 5 foot 8 inches tall, and had beautiful brown eyes. Bonnie was a loving mother, sister, and co-worker. I had the pleasure of talking with her niece, Megan, who never had the opportunity to meet her before she disappeared in 1986. The way Megan speaks about her aunt shows how much the family truly cares about her. Bonnie was my aunt. She's my mom's sister. She was big time mom to all of her kids. She, I mean, that's really what she was known for. She liked to hang out with her friends and whatnot, but being a mom was really who she was. And that's when she went, when she disappeared and, you know, everybody was told she just ran away. That was the first major red flag was she didn't take her kids. And I was born right after she went missing. So I didn't have hands on experience with Bonnie. I just, you know, the stories my mom and my grandmother have told. And really I'm, I have been the fighting voice behind trying to get justice for her. She loved her family. That was who she was. She was full of energy, full of life, very, very social. I mean, she was a people person. She was not a recluse at all. And for her to go from that to just one day vanished, it just, it doesn't make sense for her to, you know, us to be told that she just walked away one day never contact her family again? Absolutely not. 
There's no way that was possible. On May 9th, 1986, Bonnie and her husband, Eddie, got into a bit of an argument. This is something that was kind of commonplace for them. They argued a lot. They were both having affairs. Bonnie told Eddie that she was planning on leaving him and that she was going to take her kids because that's the kind of mother she was. She would not leave her children behind. She took the evening, spent it at a girlfriend's house to cool off, and that girlfriend dropped her off the next day, May 10th, at her place of work. Bonnie worked just down the street from her home at the Loco Cafe, where she waitressed. She worked at a cafe, which was literally right down the road from her house, just a couple blocks. She went to work that morning per usual, and she was at the cafe. It was around lunchtime, and she went home to get some tuna. They needed tuna for the special that day. And she went home, and that was the last she was ever seen was when she left the cafe. Her husband, Eddie, said that she came home, they got in an argument, and that she walked out the door, and he never saw her again. But he himself is the one who said that there was an argument, and that she walked out the front door, and he watched her leave until, or walk until he could no longer see her. Well, if you've ever physically been to his house, the road there's only one road in front of it. Remember how I told you this town of Loco, Oklahoma is so small that it's called a village? There is only one road in and out of where Bonnie and Eddie lived, and it is a rural road at that. It is paved, but it's straight, and you could watch someone walk for a good distance before they would disappear from your sight. Her car was left at the house. She was a big time smoker. Always, she always had her cigarettes. Um, her purse was left at the house. Her glasses, her mm-hmm. cigarettes, her money. Um, she had this. My grandfather passed not too long before she went missing, and she had a picture of him. And she took it everywhere. Even when she went camping with her family, she took this picture of my grandfather, and that picture was left there. It just. It's like she just vanished. And, you know, a mad woman, when they leave, they're going to at least take their cigarettes and their glasses to see. All of that was left at home. When Bonnie left the cafe to gather those extra cans of tuna from her personal cupboard, her co-worker, Shirley, watched her walk the entire distance home. Again, this is a dead-end road. One way in, one way out. Shirley continued to watch through the entire lunch hour that Bonnie was gone for Bonnie to return. She never saw Bonnie leave the house, even though Eddie is adamant that she came home, they got into an argument immediately, and that Bonnie stormed out. It was incredibly strange that Bonnie did not return to work. She was someone who was reliable. Bonnie had also made plans with Mr. Sullivan to take his pregnant daughter to the doctor that afternoon. Four days would pass before Eddie would contact anyone about Bonnie's disappearance. The first person he contacted was Bonnie's mother and asked if she could take the kids to her lake house for a while and that Bonnie was missing. This is when he also decided to notify law enforcement. Not until a couple days after she had been gone. He didn't report her miss the next day when she supposedly walked off and never came home that evening. It was a couple days later when he finally reported her missing. When Eddie was asked why it took so long for him to report her missing, he stated that she just left in anger and would return when she was ready. She just got mad and walked off and he figured she'd come home in a couple of days he said which was very I mean like I said out of characteristic because of her kids what happens from there is my mother and grandmother lived on Lake Texoma and of course the first thing they did when they found out she was missing was try to get information and they were shut down from the beginning they actually drove to Loco and her husband Eddie went and got in my mother's face and pointed to her chest and he told her that she needed to leave and she better never come back and my mom's very I mean tough strong lady she to this day it still makes her voice shake when she talks about that because it scared her so bad 
she knew right then something was wrong. Minimal investigations and zero media coverage made Bonnie's case go cold almost immediately. One of Bonnie's daughters does remember very soon after Bonnie disappeared that she recalled seeing her dad carry a big, black, heavy trash bag to the cellar. On this property, there were two different cellars. The youngest daughter, when she was little, right after Aunt Bonnie disappeared, um, she told my grandmother that she saw her daddy drag a big, black, heavy trash bag out of the house and into the cellar. Remember, we are in Oklahoma, prime tornado alley. On this property, one was a storm cellar and the other was a root cellar. No immediate search was done of the property, which is Bonnie's last known location, according to Eddie. It's like when she disappeared, she just disappeared. That was it. Several years pass and Bonnie's case just collects dust. They run her social security number and driver's license number. And they said, well, we ran her social security number and her driver's license and nothing's hit on it over the past couple of years. And my mom was very blunt with them. She was like, obviously, that's because she's dead. Like, it's not going to hit. That's not the issue. We know she's no longer with us, but we need to know where she is or what happened. And she would get told, oh, we're looking into it and never a call back. It wasn't until I started putting pressure on it and digging back in in 2015 that we even got anything, the ball rolling at all for the first time since really she went missing. It was no files could be found. Um, Just every, I hate to say excuse, but that's the truth. Every excuse you could possibly think of throughout the 80s, throughout the 90s, early 2000s, it was the same story. And in 2015, I got a hold of somebody at the sheriff's department, Officer Riggle, mm-hmm. and we actually drove to Stevens County to Duncan. And my grandmother and my mother both did video interviews about Bonnie and, you know, when she went missing, all of it. And nothing really came from that. A couple of years later, I started working with another detective. And he actually asked me if I knew where the videotapes were. And I was like, how would I know where the videotapes were? You guys had them there. And so they were gone. I don't know if they've been found since. Nobody's ever said. Um, Her case files have been gone forever. And my mom and I, you know, of course, we're digging and digging and digging after 2016. And back when this happened, Sheriff Alexander was who was in charge And my mom somehow found his wife and we reached out to her and she told us that she had a little storage building behind her house with all of his old files in it. And she knew that Bonnie's was in there. So we let the sheriff's department know and they said they were sending somebody out there, coincidentally, somebody with the same last name, Alexander, to retrieve Aunt Bonnie's file from Mrs. Alexander. Well, sometime between... When we spoke with Mrs. Alexander and she said, yes, she had the file back there and they sent somebody, the file disappeared. And then we, of course, finally got a search warrant approved for his property and OSBI was there. This search warrant was approved three decades after Bonnie disappeared. Something is happening this June that needs more awareness. A movement has been occurring for a while. So, if true crime fascinates you and you want to learn about deviant behavior against those deemed extra vulnerable or delve into how it impacts the survivors and victims straight from the source, then be on the lookout and subscribe to A Nefarious Nightmare wherever you get podcasts. Stay safe and don't forget to be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. On June 26, 2017, OSBI and the Stevens County Sheriff's Department conducted a search on Eddie's property. 
Large equipment was brought in, a cellar was dug up, but only one, not two. Is this because there was only one cellar that they could gain access to because the root cellar had been filled in shortly after Bonnie went missing? By shortly after, I'm talking within days. The cellar had been filled in. Bonnie's garden had been torn apart because Eddie said that Bonnie would never be back. All that stood where Bonnie's garden once was 30 years prior was a concrete slab. We watched them take boxes of stuff from the house, but mainly from the cellar, and put in the OSBI truck. And when, whatever they retrieved from the cellar, they put it in the OSBI truck, and they left immediately. They never excavated it. They went down into it, and they removed boxes from it because we watched them. But as far as what they did down there, I have no idea. They were very tight-lipped about that, which if you've ever dug into the rumors and everything, everybody in Boko says that's where she was at. Yeah. They had a lot of equipment, but we watched the whole thing, and we never saw the cellar actually get excavated and when we've asked about it the first time they asked we were told that stuff was in a box on the floor and hadn't been gone through yet they had had time and then after that nothing with eddie being the last person to see bonnie alive and the suspicions that surround his actions shortly after it raises a lot of questions was there more to their marriage than just the occasional argument? It was just a marriage, I guess. My uh, grandmother, she said, you know, had she ever felt that he was abusive or anything, then, you know, she would have said something or interfered. But since she went missing and stuff we were told that there would be times that bonnie would show up to the cafe to work and she would have black eyes or bruises on her and which you know my family didn't know that but none of us lived around loco so we weren't aware of that until after really yeah we started digging and but 2016 17 is when all this kind of came to surface bonnie's family waited for weeks after the search before they reached out to law enforcement to see if they could provide any insight as to what they found. When we did the search, we we were told they found a treasure trove of information. It was exactly like word for word verbatim what we were told by an officer named John Smith. And he said, we know, you know, we all know he's guilty. We know he did it. We found a treasure trove of information. And we were like, great. So we called in a few weeks nothing um officer smith was very good at communication mainly with my mother he would try to update her the best he could and then suddenly one day he's gone he took early retirement and that was the last person who ever helped us get any information at all and from that point on we went back up there once i believe because they told us they had you know sit down and talk to us that they you know this is what they know And the stories changed three or four times. We went from saying, you know, we know he did it and this and that to now supposedly they found that a a car with men picked Bonnie up on the road in front of her house and took her to somebody's trailer house and shot her in the head. And when they told us this, I said... Okay. Eddie said he watched her walk out of the house and down the road until he could no longer see her anymore. He told us that himself. And you're telling me that a car of men picked her up for whatever reason right there on that same road. And he didn't see it when he said... He watched her walk until he couldn't see her anymore. I said, on that road, it's not possible. Somebody picked her up on that road. He saw it. If somebody picked her up on that little road, and he would have seen it. I said, so who's lying? Whoever told you this information you're telling me, or Eddie? 
And then they got mad at me and that, we were on the phone with a three-way with my mom when that happened and basically hung up on me. And that was the last conversation we've ever had with anybody at the sheriff's department. Cause I said, I want to know who's lying. And that was it. That was the wrong thing to say, I guess. I haven't spoken with anybody from the police department. We were just told it was left open as an ongoing investigation. And I have emails telling me they had some other areas to search. They were, you know, waiting on that. And then it was always some excuse. They had this going on or this or that. And, you know, we even offered, we're like, we'll help get the equipment. Like if money's an issue and you supposedly have an area to dig for her body, we'll pay for the equipment. That's not the issue. And nothing. Then... They had to get approval for this, you know, Mm -hmm. and we've tried to, we'll pay for it all. Just go dig it up. Well, then they had to have permission from property. It was just one thing after another. Cadaver dogs were never used or brought in to sniff around the cellar to see if there could potentially be something buried in the floor. That was another thing I had asked. I even had emails of asking if we could reach out to, you know, cadaver dog company, we would pay for it if this county or the sheriff's department couldn't afford to fund it we would do it nope eddie did not live on the property at the time of the search and has since passed away at this point in the investigation there are no leads there is nothing more that can be done until evidence is found to be honest with you i don't know what happened to everything that they took from the house To be honest with you, it probably is gone, whatever it was. We were told that they found uh, these luminol or whatnot and the lights and saw blood on the door frame going out the back door. And when I asked about that, they said, oh, well, that just means she lived there. She could have cut her hand or something. And I'm like, why would there be blood on the door frame going out the back door towards the cellar? We were like, okay. (laughs) Odd. Did you find blood anywhere else in the house or just the same door that happens to be going out back to the cellar? I asked Megan how we could help. How do we get people to talk? Do we mail out flyers and hope someone's ready to say something? Do we see if we can get a search together? She doesn't believe that we would gain consent to access the property, but someone has to know something. I think people did but it's also been so long i think a lot of the people that did know are deceased that seems to be an issue we've ran into a lot is their circle of friends and associates a lot of them are no longer around i mean 95 percent of the people who were on the police force when all of this first happened are all deceased That's been a huge red flag. And for whatever reason, the current administration there wants nothing to do, it seems like. They were all for it, and then they went and did the search, and something happened. I don't know what. I don't know what they found out or who it was related to, but something happened after that search that made everybody there shut down. And it was like just like it was before 2015 when I finally got somebody to listen there. There has to be somebody up there that knows something and for whatever reason are too scared to say something. Because in a town the size of Loco, I don't care if it was Eddie who killed her or it was Sam down the street or across town. In a community that small, that close-knit, nothing stays hidden forever. Somebody knows. The family knows the chance of finding Aunt Bonnie alive is slim, but they are actively seeking answers. They know that she would not have left her children. She also left her vehicle. We would like to extend a thank you to the ever-talented Kyle Rebar for his audio work on today's episode. Someone saw something. Just by listening to our content, you you too are advocating for justice for these families. Thank you for making a difference in their lives as well. We want to share a few ways you can support us to continue our mission. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $5 per month or a simple rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. 
platform helps us get in front of someone who may I know something. I also am asking we our will continue to shed a light on the forgotten victims, Bonnie's untangle the webs of deceit, flyer. and examine we the eerie do coincidences lot, that make these cases so it compelling. It just takes one person. We believe that working to together it. can affect change and create a world where victims are heard, justice is served, and communities are empowered to make a difference, no matter where or who they are.